Okay, so let us continue our discussion from uh, the previous module. So today, uh, now we are going to start module three. Okay, so module one and two are completed. So we are extending our discussion from module three, uh, which I have named as deformation of sheet in plane stress. Deformation of sheet in plane stress. So in this is a, actually a small module. So in this, uh, we are going to discuss about. Uh, some theoretical and some practical aspects okay uh, and some calculations you know like that okay so um, to start with uh, in the previous chapter uh, we were discussing about uh, we can evaluate uh, strains principal strains epsilon 1 2 and 3 which is going to depend on the initial and original dimension of a particular element we worked out some problem two problems also in the previous chapter right so now then further strains, uh, if you calculate, you can calculate effective strain, then effective stress by knowing some flow stress model from effective stress by knowing an yield function, you can get a sigma 1 and by knowing a beta alpha, you can get a sigma 2. Okay? So, from there onwards, you can get a, a hydrostatic stress and principal stress, uh, you know, deviatoric stresses. So, all this can be calculated along with the work done. That is the way we started. right? So, now the first important thing is to evaluate uh, the uh, you know strains at different locations of a sheet. So, how do we do it practically? So, so we start with that discussion and then we go ahead with some important aspects in this particular chapter. So, now, uh, so here I have given three figures A, B and um, you have C. Okay. So, uh, you can imagine that A is basically an undeformed sheet. Okay. This is basically an undeformed sheet and this is a deformed sheet. Okay, and this is a deformed sheet and this is a deformed sheet. Okay. So, now the question is how do you calculate uh, your strains? So, if an undeformed sheet of thickness T0, uh, let us say initial thickness T0 is marked with grid of circles of diameter D0 okay. so, uh, or a square mesh or a square grid of uh, you know dimension let us say d naught okay then during uniform deformation the circles will become ellipse okay with major and major minor diameters as d1 and d2 correct so what does that mean that means uh, suppose you have a sheet you know through which i mean using that you are going to do deep drawing or stretching or any sheet forming operations first of all you have to put lot of circles on the sheet surface okay you have to uh, etch or you have to print several circles of known dimensions say for example this d naught okay so i have just given you some example four circles 1 2 3 4 of diameter d naught d naught could be maybe about uh, let us say 20 uh, mm let us say 2 cm you can say 20 mm okay so let us say 2 cm you can say okay so uh, you know small uh, you know circles you can you can put okay or maybe like uh, you know 10 mm you know circles you know like which is one centimeter dimension like that you can put okay small dimensions okay and uh, smaller the uh, diameter of the uh, you know these grids uh, you can calculate strains at a very localized region okay that is a uh, you know thing okay so I just given you a reference okay like this so you can look into uh, you know different standards how to do it so anyway so now given a sheet where you know uh, you are going to put lot of circles on the sheet surface okay and uh, uh, what will happen to the circles when you deform it? It is going to become an ellipse like this depending on whatever beta or whatever alpha you are going to deform it. Okay. So, D0 is going to become D1 and D2 and D2 we are going to call it as your minor axis which is nothing but minor diameter and D1 as a major diameter. Okay. So, uh, sometimes what we do is instead of circles we can put square also, square grids are also possible okay, which is going to become D1 and D2 like a rectangle or any other distorted rectangle you can have but it is always better to put uh, grids of circles, grids of uh, circles. Okay. So, now what will happen? Okay. So, given uh, you know deformation or alpha and beta this ellipse is going to have some dimension okay, you will get D1 and D2 and from D0 which is original dimension you can get uh, epsilon 1 and 2. So, epsilon 1 is going to be ln of uh, let us say you are a D1 by D0 because the major no. So, let us say you have major and minor axis. So, epsilon 1 is let us say D1 by D0 and epsilon 2 as ln of uh, let us say D2 by D0. Okay. So, you have to be a little bit careful in which orientation you are going to pick up uh, these two strains, but uh, 
we have seen some examples accordingly you can take it okay so now the new thickness t and the deformation stresses are sigma 1 sigma 2 okay which are also referred here so this has become t small t and you have sigma 1 and uh, sigma 2 these are two principal stresses acting on the uh, sheet which is responsible for deformation okay and this sigma 1 and sigma 2 will give rise to t1 and let us say t2 which are actually called as a tension or a traction tension or traction okay so that t can be evaluated from sigma into t okay if you want t1 it will be sigma 1 into t if you want t2 it will be sigma 2 into t which is what i have given here okay t is known as tension or traction which means it is always pulled in one direction Okay. Suppose in principal direction 1 you have T1 that is sigma 1 into T assuming T to be a constant value, new thickness but constant. Okay. Sigma 1, sigma T1 is equal to sigma 1 to T which is nothing but major tension, generally it is positive in nature. Okay. And you have T2 which is sigma 2 into T which is generally called as minor tension. It is positive in stretching uh, but opposite negative when you go for compression type of uh, deformation. Okay. So, T can be found out as sigma into T. Okay. So, now uh, you know how to calculate epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 and from there you can calculate epsilon 3 uh, or you can directly calculate T by T naught. Okay, with respect to this figure you can get epsilon 3 is equal to ln of T by T naught. We have seen some examples before in the, in the previous chapter. Okay. So, now such uh, evaluation of strains will give you something called as a strain distribution okay, in the entire deformed sheet which will give you some important information. Uh, during the deformation process. Okay. So, what do we do? Say for example, you take a deep drawing, I have just given you as example of cup deep drawing, cylindrical cup deep drawing. Okay. So, you have a blank and you have punch, you have die and there is a blank holder. So, you know what is the meaning of blank holder? Blank holder is going to hold the sheet between the die and the blank holder and you are going to give some force. Let us say you have give a force of BHF, let us say a blank holding force is given here. Okay. And uh, you know that there is no restriction for the movement of uh, sheet in the radial direction, it moves actually, okay, but only restriction is through friction, okay. There is otherwise there is no constraint. So finally, you are going to get a, a cylindrical cup like this. We have seen this example before, okay. So now I have a partially drawn cup, okay. Similar diagram we have seen before. I have partially drawn cup, okay. I have just shown you one sector of that. So this you know is a flange region, this is a cup wall region, and this is a cup bottom region, okay. That is known to you. So now we want to evaluate strain. Now we want to, we are going to pick up this deep drawing as a process, we are going to evaluate strain at 6 different locations, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. So, we are starting from cup center to the, uh, uh, you know, your uh, this, your uh, punch corner, then in the cup wall, then in the die corner and somewhere in the flange and at the edge, 6 different locations we are picking and you imagine that this entire sheet on the sheet surface from top view if you see, okay, on the sheet surface is going to be a sheet is going to be a circular one and there are a lot of circles you know printed on it and you are doing deep drawing and you are going to pick up these six locations to get a strain distribution okay and that is what they simply referred as we evaluate strain in all these locations and by measuring the grids okay and I can plot a graph between epsilon 1 and 2 okay epsilon 1 and 2 and you should note down here that epsilon 2 can have negative and positive value and epsilon 1 we are keeping always as a positive value. Okay. So, epsilon 2 uh, is in x axis and epsilon 1 is in uh, y axis and you are going to calculate uh, all the strains and you are going to plot here. I have shown two different stages. Okay. So, this is your stage number 1 and this distribution is for stage number 2 at 6 different locations. So, it starts with the edge. This edge is here. Okay. It starts with the edge and it moves to a center. So, this is your center of the cup. Okay. So, you can see that uh, you know maybe in the stage 1. Okay, let us pick up stage 1, okay, which has got the lower strains as compared to stage 2 naturally. Okay, and uh, stage 1 is center location, you have strain here and then here and then the third location is somewhere on the y axis okay, and uh, the fourth location is here, fifth location is here and the edge it is somewhere in the negative uh, you know epsilon 2. Okay, probably beta is going to be minus in there. So, now if you further deform it and the same location, same grids, I am going to monitor the new dimensions, new diameters and I am going to get epsilon 1 and 2 and I am going to plot here in the 6 different locations and you will see that this is the second stage. So, what do you get from this? You can get the present status of deformation in the 6 different salient locations. 
six different salient locations and six different locations will have six different betas and alphas. You can see this dotted line tells, let us say this is one beta, this is another beta, this is one, four, five, six, six different betas you can imagine. Okay, this will give you the entire feel for how strain is getting distributed in this. And when you compare first stage and second stage, the regions are not equally deformed. The regions are not equally deformed. You see that? So, here the strains are closer and when you move towards the edge, it is deviating a lot. It is deviating a lot. So, it will also tell you which location is going to deform significantly as compared to the, the other locations. Okay. So, such a strain distribution can be evaluated uh, for any uh, sheet deformation or even for tube deformation process also to get an idea where you are going to have uh, what type of strain distribution where you are going to have uh, strain localization which is going to be responsible for let us say uh, instability or uh, you know fracture which you are going to see later on or necking like that. Okay. So, I just uh, summarized you know whatever I have discussed with you here. Okay. The strains are located at locations mentioned in figure B. The strains are plotted on these locations okay, on these locations okay, in strain space epsilon 1 and 2 graph and strain locus can be obtained in a particular stage. So, this is called as one strain locus. This is called as another strain locus. Same location, two different stages. You can also have third stage which could be something like this. So, fourth stage, fifth stage something like that until you have a full cup form. Okay. The strain locus may expand uniformly till a stage and later some points may stop straining. Okay. Then a process limit is reached. That is what I gave an example. Probably this region will stop straining if you further deform it because the strain gradients are very low here. But here you will see that there is significant deformation growing on in these locations. Okay. So, the, this typical strain pattern is called as a strain signature. Okay. This strain signature can be obtained for different processes at different stages and there are certain advantages of that. Okay. So, just to summarize how do you calculate the principal strains? You have epsilon 1 which is nothing but d1 by d0. Epsilon 1 is d1 by d0. What did I write? Yeah. So, epsilon 1 is d1 by d0, epsilon is d2 by d0 and epsilon 3 is you know ln of t by t0 or you can get it from epsilon 1 and 2 at a particular location like this you are going to get for all the grids. Okay. So, now if you know epsilon 1 and 2, okay, so then you can get beta. That is why we have six different locations, six different uh, you know beta, six different strain ratios or strain paths. Epsilon 2 by 1, 2 is d2 ln of d2 by d1 divided by ln of d1 by d0. Okay. And uh, if beta is a, a constant, we call that as a linear strain path. What do you mean by strain path? Strain path is nothing but the mode of deformation. Okay. Nothing but the mode of deformation. So, strain path means this is one strain path. Okay. Let us say you are going to pick up from 0. Okay. This, this particular element is following this particular strain path like this. Okay. Essentially beta. Okay. That is considered as linear. It is not going to change. It is not going to become non-linear. If it becomes non-linear which can happen then you have to be a little bit careful. There is something happening when there is a change from you know one slope to another slope. You have to be careful. Okay. So, how do you get epsilon 3? We are actually summarizing what is required for such strain signature. So, epsilon 3 is ln of t by t naught which is equal to nothing but minus of 1 plus b down to epsilon 1 which is again equal to minus of 1 plus b down to ln of d1 by d0. Okay, so, you do not need to measure this. Rather, you can uh, get d0 which is known to you. Okay, let us say 10 mm and uh, let us say you have uh, d1. You can measure it and get it. So, beta is fixed. Okay, so, you can substitute it and you will get epsilon 3. And from epsilon 3, you can get uh, the current thickness which is nothing but t0 exponential epsilon 3 or t0 exponential minus of 1 plus beta into epsilon 1. So, epsilon 3 you can substitute it here. Okay. Alternatively, you can get T as you know volume remains constant okay, in a particular grid. Okay. You can get this uh, equation and from there onwards you can get T. T is nothing but T naught D naught square divided by D 1 D 2 where D naught is nothing but diameter of the initial circle grid and T naught is at the thickness original thickness at that location and D 1 and D 2 are the new dimensions of that ellipse that will give you t. So, either you can get t from this or you can get t from this. So, the entire summary of this is you can get just by putting circle grids you can get epsilon 1, 2 and 3 okay, and you can plot it at any number of locations which will give you uh, a strain locus or strain distribution uh, in the entire section and that will give you some idea of what type of deformation you are going to have and whether it is equally uh, deforming at different stages or uh, it is going to be a different type of deformation, different locations that can be obtained. Okay. This I think I told you. 
okay the whole summary is this assuming beta to be constant okay beta can change okay beta can change okay so now let's come to modes of deformation we will give some uh, you know take more ideas into these modes of deformation or modes of deformation is nothing but beta or alpha okay so what all the information that we are going to get from this each point in the strain diagram indicates a magnitude of final major and minor strain and the assumed linear strain path to reach this particular point right suppose you pick up this particular point let us say okay this is again a plot between epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 correct let us pick up this particular point let us say a okay it, it has got a magnitude of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 assuming this linear strain path to reach that particular point same way for ob oc od and oe right so now this ellipse which i have shown here this ellipse which i have shown here okay is nothing but a contour of equal effective strain epsilon bar just to give some idea it's a contour of equal effective strain okay it's a contour of equal effective strain that means you deform the sheet along oa and you stop here ob you stop here oc you stop here od you stop here and oe you stop here and uh, they have to be stopped at uh, almost the same effective strain okay and then you join it to create a contour okay so and uh, from the work hardening hypothesis uh, they will all have same sigma f at that particular location okay so the ellipse shown is in the contour is a contour of equal effective strain epsilon bar each point on the ellipse will represent strain in the material element that from work hardening hypothesis has the same flow stress sigma f okay anyway so that is just one small information but what is very important for us is what is this signify oa ob oc od and oe that's what we are going to discuss now in the uh, next uh, this particular sections so before discussing just uh, get a uh, you know some idea from this diagram so this anyway is a plot between epsilon 1 and 2 and you will see that uh, i am representing oa path which is denoted by beta is equal to 1 okay that means epsilon 2 by 1 is equal to 1 so epsilon 1 is equal to epsilon 2 okay and here ob when you go along this path you are going to have beta is equal to 0 okay which is nothing but epsilon 2 0 which could be called as a plane strain process okay because uh, as i already told you when you have oa this particular point okay there is one epsilon 2 and 1 associated with this point a and there is epsilon 3 inside that okay so epsilon 3 has to be calculated from this location epsilon 1 and 2 so epsilon 3 exists inside okay so which means that uh, you can call this as epsilon 2 as 0 ah, so that is why you have only epsilon 1 but epsilon 3 exists so it's, you can call this as a plane strain deformation okay similarly oc you can say beta is equal to minus half od you can say beta is equal to minus 1 and oe which is also a critical strain path beta is equal to minus 2 we get and you can also see how these ellipses are going to how the circles are going to get deformed so here the circle will become a larger circle okay so that if you get beta it will be equal to 1 right so this dimension d0 is known to you okay and the new dimension let us say this d1 comma d2 both are same comma d2 both are same so you can calculate uh, your epsilon 1 and 2 from the previous formula okay and you will get uh, the strains to be same that's why beta is equal to 1 if you come to this particular plane strain you will see that it is going to become ellipse but the minor axis will be same as that of your circle that is why you have strain to be 0 in that direction but otherwise you have epsilon 1 and epsilon 3 and here onwards the ellipse is going to be inside the circle okay so you can see ellipse has gone inside further inside and further inside ellipse is actually getting compressed okay in the width direction what is this thin and thickens we will come to this after this particular discussion okay so uh, now there is a limit for this beta there is a limit for this beta beta generally uh, changes from 1 to minus uh, 2 okay that is what I am saying beta is equal to 1 is one limit beta is equal to minus 2 is another limit okay and in between you can have any number of uh, betas depending on what deformation you are going to do but we are just shown here 5 different betas okay 5 different uh, betas 1 0 minus half minus 1 and minus 2 okay so now let us uh, go into some important uh, uh, details about this each strain path oa ob oc od and oe and where do you see this type of situations that also we can have to some some extent we can have some idea okay let us go for point a point a is along that means you are picking up oa path okay you are picking up oa path this path this path is actually called as a balanced biaxial stretching or equal biaxial stretching okay we call it as beta is equal to 1 okay 
So, what are the salient features in this? This beta is equal to 1 can be seen in this type of situations. Okay. What is the situation? Situation is there is a circle and circle is going to become a bigger circle. So, it will become a concentric circle. Okay. So, and you will see uh, this type of situation in a circle which is uh, inscribed on the, the uppermost point when you do this kind of deformation. Like uh, there is a sheet which is kept in a blank holder okay, and uh, the punch is you know getting displaced here and your sheet is getting deformed here right. So, this is the height of deformation, this is your height of deformation, this much it has deformed and you will see beta is equal to 1 situation somewhere in the mid portion, in the uppermost portion that is the pole region. That element is actually if you put a circle on that particular location, it is pulled equally in both the directions. So, it will be like this. Okay. So, beta is equal to 1. Okay. What will happen to thickness strain? Thickness strain can be uh, obtained. So, if beta is equal to 1, what is thickness strain? So, thickness strain uh, with beta, what is the equation we have? We have this equation, is not it? So, thickness strain is equal to minus of 1 plus beta into epsilon 1, correct. So, beta is let us say, we say 1. Is not it? So, 1 means minus 2 epsilon 1, epsilon 3 is equal to minus 2 epsilon 1. What does it mean? That means, so you have a particular strain okay, and uh, your thickness is going to decrease rapidly with respect to your strain in principal direction 1. Okay. So, it is minus 2 times of minus signifies that thickness strain is negative which means you are going to have thinning and twice, twice means the thickness is going to reduce more rapidly with respect to epsilon 1. Okay. So, epsilon 1 is you know like in that location epsilon 1 you can get from d naught and d 1 d 2, but for a particular epsilon 1 okay, if that element is actually stretching like this then you will have a thickness decreases more rapidly as per this particular equation twice, it is going to decrease twice. Okay. And uh, there is one more important feature that we need to understand epsilon bar is equal to 2 times epsilon 1, epsilon bar is equal to 2 times epsilon 1. So, how do you get the moment you go for epsilon bar which is nothing but your effective strain by using one minus equation we already derived this, okay. we already derived this equation in the last section and you can put beta is equal to 1 here. So, this is going to be 1, 1, so 3, 3, 3 will be cancelled, it will be yeah, so uh, 2 into epsilon 1. Okay. So, epsilon bar will be equal to 2 into epsilon 1. What does that mean? That means, uh, the sheet is going to work out and rapidly with respect to epsilon 1. So, you give strain in principal direction 1 and you calculate it, uh, but you will see epsilon bar effective strain will be twice than that of that. Okay. So, so now you, you can get epsilon bar from this and sigma bar is equal to k epsilon power n, you can substitute for a constant k and n, you can get sigma bar. Okay. So, and you will see that the sheet work hardening is going to be rapid in this particular type of deformation. That means, you have a sheet that is a component that is made okay. and at one particular location let us say a set of elements are deforming in equibaxial stretching a strain path where beta is equal to 1, then in that location you will see thinning is going to be significant and work hardening is also going to be significant. Okay. So, with respect to what? Because when we are saying you know thickness strain is going to be uh, you know thickness is going to decrease uh, you know rapidly and strain hardening is going to be rapid. No, with respect to what? With respect to epsilon 1, but then we are also comparing with other strain parts. Let us go for point B. This point B okay, is like this. So, wherever you have this OB uh, strain path, you will see that if there is an area circle, circle will become an ellipse, but the change in dimension in this direction okay, is going to be negligible. So, it will remain as a plane strain type of analysis, it will become plane strain. So, where is OB in this diagram? OB is here, you go along y axis, but epsilon 3 is there inside. Huh? So, here epsilon 2 by 1 is equal to 0, so epsilon 2 is 0, so epsilon 1 will be equal to minus epsilon 3. Okay? So, now here I just simply made a single circle expands only in one direction and circle becomes ellipse in which minor axis is unchanged like this. And you can see such situation in a channel, a side wall you can say. Okay. Suppose this is a channel, sheet channel that is made, okay. channel type of deformation, okay. you will see somewhere in the cup wall region you may see that kind of situation. Let us come to point C, path OC. Path OC is what? Path OC is this path beta is equal to minus 1 by 2. This is known to us. Beta is equal to minus 1 by 2, for that alpha is going to be 0 which means it is a uniaxial type of deformation, it is uniaxial tension, we have seen that predominantly. 
So when sigma 2 is equal to 0, like in the iniaxial tensile test, that is the situation you see here. Okay, that means your stretch stretches in one direction and contracts in the other direction. So ellipse has started going inside the circle dimension. And generally, you can see such type of situation exists in the uh, whole expansion test at the edge. Okay, so one has to really look into it, but some idea you will get from this kind of application. Okay, you can see, suppose a hole is stretched, actually pushed in this direction, you may see this kind of situations here. Point D, this point you already discussed in one of the problem, your point D, that means you are following path OD and you are reaching this point D, okay, which is described by beta is equal to minus 1. Okay. This OD path is also called as drawing or constant thickness process, constant thickness process. I think uh, constant thickness process, this example we have seen in the uh, second problem of the previous model. Isn't it where we are trying to compare two different, uh, you know, uh, betas, right? One of that is basically drawing our uh, constant thickness process. I also referring to the calculation and say that epsilon 3 is 0 there, which means thickness is not going to change at all. And uh, you will see in such cases, ellipse is going to further compressed inside, okay, in the your minor dimension side, okay, the minor dimension it has gone, is further compressed and you can see such situation existing in the flange region of the cup that is formed, okay. So here you will see that the principal strains are equal and opposite, uh, epsilon 2 by 1 is equal to minus 1, so equal and opposite. Okay. So observed in flange region of drawing, that is what I was telling you and work hardening is gradual. Work hardening is gradual, how will you find out? Okay. You will see that uh, here. Okay. So uh, before that you can find out epsilon 3 is equal to minus of 1 plus beta not epsilon 1 and beta is equal to minus 1, so epsilon 3 is going to be 0. What does it mean? That means, if you deform a material in this particular strain path, you can deform the material path to a particular strain, but without much change in the thickness. So, thickness strain is going to be almost 0. Okay. So, now for this also you can get epsilon bar, right. So, what is epsilon bar? Epsilon bar is this equation and your beta is equal to minus 1 you put here. So, 1 minus 1 plus 1, okay. so square root of uh, you know 4 by so 2 by square root of 3 into epsilon 1. So, 2 by square root of the end epsilon 1, which is nothing but 1.155 times epsilon 1. And you, when you compare this with the previous fellow, that is your point A, it is a 2 times of uh, two times of epsilon 1. This is what I was telling you. If you compare these two process, epsilon bar is equal to 2 epsilon 1 and uh, epsilon bar is equal to 1.155 times epsilon 1. And you can say that here work hardening is actually very gradual. In the other case, when you go for balanced biaxial stretching or equibiaxial stretching, this is going to be rapid. Okay. So, one has to be very, very careful in this type of uh, deformation, which deformation you are going to pick up. And there is one more point called as point E. Okay. And if you pick up a point OE, that is the least one, okay, minus 2. Okay. Here also you can see that epsilon bar will be equal to minus epsilon 2. And of course, you can also get this type of relationship. Okay. If you put a sigma bar equation, uh, square root of 1 minus alpha plus alpha square into sigma 1, is not it? It is there if you put a uh, you can get uh, sigma bar and you will see that it will be equal to minus sigma 2 and epsilon bar equation can also be obtained uh, beta is equal to let us say minus 2 beta is equal to minus 2 1 minus 2 plus uh, uh, 4 minus 2 2 okay into uh, this one so you will get uh, minus epsilon 2 epsilon bar will be equal to minus uh, epsilon 2 so now there is one more point to this uh, here this point E is generally seen in the edge of the flange. Okay. We call it as uniaxial compression. That means the ellipse is going to further compressed in the width direction. Okay. And this is actually a location where sheet is going to thicken. Okay. We have seen one, uh, one example, no? in the first problem where sheet thickness is actually a little bit increased. Okay. So, the, I think initial thickness was 0 0.8 and after calculating the new thickness, it was 0 0.838 or 0 0.84 like that. So, which means the sheet thickness has increased. That type of situation can come probably at the edge of the, you know, this flange and uh, you have to be very careful with part OE because that can create wrinkling. Okay. It is pulled in one direction and pushed in this direction. No. So, in plane, right. So, so, so what will happen? Now, the sheet will try to move up out of plane, okay, which is what you are going to call it as a wrinkling on the flange region, which is a defect actually which is a defect. That is why you are actually providing sufficient blank holding force to suppress it. Okay. So, that will happen here. Okay. So, these are the five important 
uh, you know modes of deformation okay beta or alpha you can say of course now we are going to see how to get alpha from beta and this all this beta is going to have different uh, situations okay from uh, oa being uh, you know equibiaxial okay then uh, you have uh, OB which is uh, pain strain, then uh, you have uh, uniaxial, then uh, you have uh, drawing, then you have uh, uniaxial compression. Okay, these five are going to be important and of course, you can have uh, uh, any uh, strain parts in between. In between also, you can have any strain parts uh, to pick up your deformation. Okay, so now there are, uh, there is uh, one more point in this diagram. I have copied the same figure here, epsilon 1 versus epsilon 2. In this, you will see, you can divide this beta into two parts. Okay, one a beta greater than minus 1, 1 greater than, you know, beta greater than minus 1. That means, a minus 1, minus 2, 0 and 1. In these strain paths, if you see, the material will actually thin down, okay. Material will actually thin down, okay. And beta is equal to minus 1 is a transit, okay. It is a transit region and that is why you have 0 thickness strain. That means, it is not going to thin, it is not going to be thickening. So, no thinning and no thickening, okay. This is a transit region. And if you go on this side, right hand side, okay, of this diagram, then you will have a thinning in all these strain paths. Uh, and if you go on this side of beta, that means your beta, uh, you know, less than minus one, that that's between minus one and minus two, you will see the sheet becomes thicker. You will see the sheet becomes thicker. So beta, with respect to beta, you can divide the sheet forming deformation into rather two parts. One is uh, those deformation process which involves thinning, and that will be beta greater than minus one. This side, okay. And the other part is actually beta less than minus 1, which is going to be sheet getting thicker. Okay, so now uh, we will come back to this uh, after this discussion. So now uh, uh, this part, this small part, we are going to discuss about different effective stress strain loss. Okay, so uh, effective stress, effective strain loss means uh, how do you relate F sigma bar to epsilon bar? Okay, so one or two equations we have already seen. Okay, but we will see that in the effective terms. Okay. So, the first law that we are going to see and we are, uh, uh, we have already seen this several uh, locations uh, including problems that is nothing but sigma bar is equal to k epsilon bar power n. It is called the power law. It is called power law. Okay. And uh, this equation is predominantly used in uh, all the calculations and we have also used this equation, similar equation in our problem also. When you are trying to find sigma bar from epsilon bar and you remember sigma bar can be related to sigma 1 and sigma 2 by any yield function like 1 minus yield function which you already derived. Okay. So, now you know how to find k and n from this, right. So, standard uh, procedure is there you do any axial tensile test get the load displacement graph convert that into true stress strain data, right. So, and um, for isotropic material we say that effective stress strain curve is going to be coinciding with uni axial stress strain curve that we already derived. Okay, sigma bar is equal to sigma 1 and epsilon bar is equal to d epsilon 1 or epsilon 1 we already discussed. So, if that is the case, then you can get k and n from the slope of a natural logarithm plot of sigma versus natural logarithm plot of epsilon and that will be n and the intercept will give you k value, correct. So, now if you substitute this equation, this equation is ready. Let us say sigma bar is equal to 200 epsilon bar power 0 0.25 means by giving different epsilon bar values, you can get different sigma bar values and that can be compared with experimental data like this. Okay. And depending on how you fit, you will have agreement between these two curves. Okay. But there is one problem to this. Uh, problem is for zero strain, you will have zero stress. For zero strain, you will have, let us say, zero stress. Okay. Uh, it does not predict the actual yield stress. What does it mean? That means, Suppose the material is already undergone some deformation before coming to tensile test, that means the material is already hardened to some extent, is not it? That will not be captured by this fit, this equation. Why? Because when you put epsilon bar as 0, you will get the strength as 0. So, that means it is going to start from here, okay? as if like there is no yielding happened. Okay? Actually, there is a initial yielding that has happened, which is going to actually start from here, which will not be predicted by this particular power law, but still it is predominantly used. Now, to, to capture that, the change in strength when you do tensile test, you introduce something called as a pre strain. Okay, this is what we uh, used it in the previous problem as probably 0 0.008 or 0 0.0008, which a small value we used. Okay, it is generally a small value. 
Okay. So now if you put epsilon bar as 0, you will see that there is a, a small you know, effective stress staying with that uh, material and uh, they may coincide uh, somewhere here. Okay. What is the physical meaning of this? This pre strain, the meaning epsilon bar is called as pre strain. Okay, it is going to take care of the materials hardened in the prior process. If the material is hardened or not in the prior process, prior process means let us say for example rolling. Okay, the material is rolled and then you are going to characterize its tensile properties. Okay, or you know several stages of deep drawing. Let us say there are seven different stages of deep drawing. That means with respect to second stage, first stage is prior formed. With respect to third stage, there are two stages before. So, how do you capture the change in strength? One way is to model the stress strain behavior using this equation. Uh, just by putting this constant epsilon naught, it is going to capture the initial strength of the material and the physical meaning of epsilon naught is this difference. Okay. So, you will see that this epsilon naught is such a small strain that you are going to give and if epsilon bar is 0, it is going to start with a particular strength which is nothing but the yield strength of a material which actually is equivalent to metal it's already hardened ability before process in the prior process. So, but in this how do you get K and N? K and N can be obtained by fitting it. Okay. So, what you can do is like you can use this equation okay, to know K and N that you know already and you can use that K and N here okay, and calibrate your uh, you know stress strain data such that your experiment and uh, you know the data from this equation are going to match. There will be one particular value of epsilon naught from which uh, you know not which you are going to have uh, you know very good agreement between these two. That could be the value of epsilon naught. But how to get K and N? K and N you can get from the the other hardening law. Sigma bar is equal to K epsilon bar power N. Okay. Uh, these two or other simple equations generally we don't use these days. Okay. So uh, again you can see the plot. Actual stress strain behavior is this only. The dotted ones are actual stress strain behavior. You can say from experiments. Okay, you can say this is from experiments. Okay, this also from experiment. Okay, so now uh, you can have an equation sigma bar is equal to y plus p epsilon bar. So when you have strain zero, sigma bar is equal to y, and that is this point, which is nothing but your yield strength. Okay, it starts from yield strength, but it is not going to have a, you know a power law based uh, strain hardening behavior. It is going to vary linearly with the uh, strain and uh, the fitting is going to be varying significantly at different locations. You can see the difference. But if you do not have any material constant, one can use it. The fourth one is further simple. Sigma bar is equal to y. This is also called as rigid perfectly plastic model. So, your actual experimental curve data point is this, but you are modeling it with the horizontal line which is equal to sigma bar is equal to y. And this is nothing but your y only, nothing but the yield strength and it is not going to harden at all. Okay, which is called as rigid perfectly plastic model. So, these are uh, four uh, equations one can use, but other than that there are several other forms of equation. Okay, there are maybe another four or five important forms are there. One can look into literature for that. We are not going to discuss it here. Okay. And uh, uh, just to complete uh, this particular uh, discussion, okay, so here what I have done is uh, for different betas uh, which I have already seen. Okay, 1, 0, minus 1 by 2, minus 1, minus 2, we can calculate alpha, is not it? So, uh, that you know alpha's alpha relationship with respect to beta you know, is not it? So, uh, we already derived it using levi meissner's flow rule, is not it? So, in that way you can calculate different alphas and you will see that for equibiaxial stretching, this is 1 and this is also 1, plain strain, this is 0, this is 1 by 2, in axial tension, this is minus 1 by 2, this is 0 for drawing it is minus 1 minus 1 for uniaxial compression it is minus 2 and if you convert that into uh, for alpha it is going to be minus infinity okay so now uh, now this this diagram can be converted to this diagram okay this diagram is we already know it's basically nothing but a plot between epsilon 1 and 2 now i want to convert that into sigma 1 versus sigma 2 which is our well known yield locus which is our well known yield locus Okay, since we are speaking more of 1 minus type, then it will be in the form of an ellipse. Of course, sigma 3 is 0, it is plain stress process. Okay, so, and uh, the same paths are noted here. OA, OB, OC, OD and OE are noted here. OA, OB, OC, OD and OE, but uh, you have to be very, very careful in comparison. Okay, OA will have almost the same location of what you see here, is not it? Because both are 1. 
Okay. So, now of course, you know that uh, this element is actually pulled equally in both the directions. So, alpha is equal to 1. So, now you pick up OB, OB is actually coinciding with y axis which is a plane strain mode of deformation. Okay. For that, if you get alpha, it is not going to coincide with y axis, we have to be very careful, it is going to be little on the right hand side of y axis that is your OB okay, where alpha is equal to half. It is also pulled in both the directions but in different proportions. OC, if you pick up, it is on the left hand side of y axis here in the strain diagram, but that is going to coincide with y axis here. Why? Because your alpha is equal to 0, which means uh, your sigma 2 is not there okay, and sigma 3 is anyway not there and uh, you are going to have you know, along the y axis. And here you will see that it is actually pulled in only one direction. Okay. So, OD here and OD here are you know looks same because it is minus 1 minus 1. Okay. And you will see that uh, the square element is actually pulled in one direction and uh, pushed in other direction or compressed in other direction maintaining alpha is equal to minus 1. Okay. So, you have to be a little bit uh, you know very careful in this. Okay. So, uh, I think in uh, when we discuss about yield locus, I have shown some example of different locations of yield locus with respect to deep drawing and I was referring there in the yield locus we are referring to plane strain. Right. So, you have to be little bit very careful that uh, this plane strain OB is actually here, is actually here in your uh, sigma 1, sigma 2 plot. This OB is actually plane strain, is actually OB here. Okay. So, the last one is actually uh, you know purely compression that is along the x axis okay, when you have sigma 1 and sigma 2 which is going to beta is equal to minus 2. Okay. So, in this way you can convert all this uh, betas into alphas. Okay. We have done some numerical problems also where you have once you got beta you can get alpha and these are the 5 prominent alphas and betas uh, you know through which you can deform material to any strain. You can have in between also it depends on the material okay, and uh, what type of deformation you are giving. You can have in between these two, you can have between plane strain uniaxial, uniaxial to drawing, drawing to uniaxial compression. Okay. So, you can have a variety of uh, values in this okay. and this can be separated and this can be separated as I was telling you, one is going to be thinning and uh, that is beta in this side, beta this side, beta greater than your minus 1, beta less than minus 1 will be divided into two parts, one for thinning, one for thickening like what we discussed here, this slide. So, okay. so we will stop here and we will continue our discussion further. Mm -hmm.